Hi everybody, welcome back to the Tetrix RoboBench video series. This is Tim and today I want to talk to you about our work cell. This is a hero model from our Tetrix expansion builds, but as you can probably tell, it's a little bit different than what we've had before because I've added Prism. One of the things that we've been trying to show you is some of the cool things that you can do when you automate these models by uh, adding the Tetrix Prism controller to our RC builds. Uh, now let me start by again pointing out this is our work cell from our Tetrix Max expansion set. This is not a beginning model. This is a model that is, um, well, well you don't have to be an expert, but it, you do have to be an experienced builder to be successful at this. Um, you can obviously follow the instructions, but this is a model that if you uh, don't pay attention to detail and you don't really understand how things work together, it can look like what the building instructions show, but it potentially couldn't function. So that's one of the benefits of doing a model like this is that you really learn through building this how things have to really work together and, and <laughs> to be able to make a functional robot. Um, so let's start with first, why would we do an RC version of this and then go to a, an automated version. There are several reasons. Um, the benefit from RC is that we can isolate um, the mechanisms and really understand how they work by themselves because I can manually operate them one at a time, focusing on just that particular part of the mechanism. So RC becomes a very um, um, easy way to do that and focus on the individual parts. After I've focused on each one and make sure they all work by themselves, then we can go on. And that's one of the advantages of going to an automated model. I have to be able to make them all work together. Um, but again, it's one of those things that that takes it to the next level uh, when you actually automate it, this because that's real life. That's what this would be in manufacturing world. It would be an automated process. So we'll talk about more of that in just a few minutes. But let's talk about what I really had to do. Now, to be able to add the prism. And I've already taken all of the RC gear off, so it's not on this model right now, but um, the RC gear was located right down in the middle uh, on this lower right side. I've taken that off. I had to relocate my switch. I'll rotate this around <laughs> my switch. I moved over here on this side because it was back on this back side. Uh, it was down over here. So I relocated my switch. And that was really the only thing that I had to remove from my RC model. Now, I did add some other things, and we'll talk about that to make this work as a functioning thing because, again, I've got a closed system here where traditionally I would add several of these type of uh, processes involved and you would move the part from one to the other, but I made this a closed system. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But this is a model that specifically where some challenges when you talk about mounting the prism, like the trackbot when we mounted the prism, we had to find a real estate where I could flat mounting place for the prism. I put it over here, but with this model specifically because I've added several sensors to automate it, I had to really be aware of accessibility. Where were my wires going to route to where I had um, uh, access and make sure that the, the wires reached not being interfering with anything, uh, but still be able to reach my prism. That had to be a real thought uh, process as far as where I could I put it to make sure that. And then also I wanted to make sure that I had access to my programming port. Because again, if I've got to turn my robot upside down or um, put my cord in a bind to be able to program it, that becomes very inconvenient. So we had to make sure that we had accessibility. So that was a major consideration when we talked about mounting the prism, and this seemed to be a good place for me. The other thing that, that we wanna talk about is some of the other changes, again, because I had to make this a closed loop, um, there are some things that are gonna be different than what um, basically you had on, if you build this model from the instructions. I added this whole front um, part right here in order to be able to take the part from this side, and you'll see this operate in a minute, so you'll get the idea, but take the part from here, bring it back around here, and make it a closed loop so I don't have to manually uh, load the, the ball. So that was one of the changes that I had to make. Um, the other thing that I wanna point out is that because of 
the fact that this is a round part. This would be much easier to do if we had a flat part, but um, because this is round, on my conveyor belt, I actually added the little rubber treads to be able to manually or more securely move that along the belt because, um, again, this is one of those things that the extra learning that you get with a model like this, uh, Newton's Law, uh, body wants to stay at rest, so when you start moving that belt, uh, it could actually rotate the ball and instead of moving along the belt, uh, moving along the belt, the ball just spins. So that was one of the things I added, the little rubber treads, and I had to tweak it in several little places, including adding sensors to be able to uh, actually have the prism understand where the part was along in the process. So let's go ahead and break that down a little bit more as far as where I actually added everything and what they do. Okay, so let's go ahead and detail some of the things that I've added from a sensor perspective because I actually added five different sensors to the model to be able to automate this process. So I did two ultrasonics and I did three line finders. So I've got an ultrasonic here and I have an ultrasonic here. Uh, if you can see those, uh, again, here and here. And then I also have three line finder sensors. I have one line finder sensor here one right here, and then finally one back here in the back. So hopefully you can see where those are at, but the sensors actually provide a couple different functions. Uh, the line finders actually become proximity sensors so that as the part or the ball moves in front of the sensor, it detects a difference in the light as far as the reflected, and it then knows that a part is there. Uh, so if I have a, a part here, the sensor knows it's there. As it goes in front of the sensor here, it actually, again, understands where the part is in this cycle of process. The ultrasonics, this particular ultrasonic is gonna tell distance how far this carriage is along my linear slide. So that's where it becomes uh, important as far as being able to locate this along the, the transverse of the slide. Um, this particular ultrasonic then finally is just acting as the overall master switch. Uh, when I move my hand or a body stands in front of that, that's when this will activate the whole process. So those are the sensors that I've added. I also added as just kind of a fun thing and also to demonstrate what a process might look like, I've added some RGB LEDs, um, two of them right down here that are going to Again, simulate what, a, what might happen in a process and when that process is finished. Some of the things that you might want to add if you are going to do uh, an extension to this is if a, a real uh, process would be that maybe we would examine the part after the fact and then decide whether or not it was good or bad. So that, was, that would be something that you could add if you wanted to. But I also added one more thing. I added a servo back over here so that as my uh, part was moving through the process, I could reload the part there. So those are the some of the things that I actually added to this particular model to make it a, a functioning closed system. But let's talk about some of the, the, the things that challenges or the learning that you came from actually um, programming this. Because again, if we were gonna do this process one cycle, that uh, can be a very linear process. I'm gonna lift this piece, I'm gonna turn my belt on, uh, as soon as it gets to this particular location, I'm gonna close my grippers, I'm gonna move it down. It becomes very linear. And uh, you really don't have to worry about, uh, because everything is starting in a known position, you don't have to worry about what we call maybe dependencies. But when you program this and you want it to be repeatable, and reliable in that repeating, you have to worry about, okay, where is this carriage when I start turn this belt on or uh, begin to lift the part? Because if this ball gets to here before uh, this is in place, it's not going to work. So you have to begin to look at it as a complete system and understand not only the sequence of how things happen, but where things have to be in order for that to be successful when they happen. So again, you have to think about dependencies. 
So that's one of the advantages of really trying to go through this process and understand it from a programming perspective. It's not really hard to turn a motor on, but it becomes important on when you turn the motor on and when um, you turn the motor off. So those are the, some of the things that you begin to get a deeper understanding of when you program a thing uh, or a, a machine or a work cell like this. Now let's talk a little bit about um, real world because one of the things, this model um, meant a lot to me because uh, I come from a background in production and, and as I was programming this and building it, it, it took me back to my days and, and really reminded me of what it was like to be a machine operator and be worried about a raw part coming in one side of the process, doing the process and then making sure that a finished good uh, process part was exiting out the other end of my my particular uh, area of operation. So this meant a lot to me and it brought back memories, but that's very important for a manufacturing um, manufacturer is to really have employees that can understand how that works and then make it efficient because ultimately this is where one of those old sayings that, that I'm sure you've heard before, time is money, it really is a very practical application of that because um, as this goes through, this creates a cycle and that cycle takes a certain amount of time. And the more that you can reduce that time for that entire cycle, then uh, becomes a more efficient process and actually a manufacturer can make more money that way. So uh, employer, employers really like to find employees that can uh, look at a process like that, whether they're the machine operator, whether they're the setter, or the maintenance person that observes this process and if they understand how things work enough to be able to say, you know what, we can improve the uh, efficiency of that, that uh, if this carriage is over here, I don't have to wait until my ball gets over here before I start that process down because that adds time. If I can start this uh, moving, uh, as soon as it releases the ball, then it's over here waiting for the ball or the next part. So that becomes an efficient process. So employers really like employees that can uh, problem solve and create more efficient processes because that means more money for them. So I think that kind of covers most of it. I, I think we're ready to try and start it and see if you can, uh, we can make it work and, and watch how it actually operates. So I'm going to power it on. You can see I've got some lights come on. And as soon as I get my green light from my prism, I think it's ready to go. I'm gonna go ahead and cross my fingers and I'm gonna press my start button. And uh, you can see that I've got an initial servos, but my program right now is idling. It's waiting for um, my ultrasonic in front to be, I have a body in front. So if I move my hand in front, my process starts. Um, my ball goes over to where my process, my light goes ahead and indicates that. I've got a good process. It releases it, takes it over. So you can see that things have to happen in a certain order. So this is an example of a work cell on a closed system where it's actually simulating a production process on a piece and uh, typically in a production situation, um, operation over here would come in and deliver a part. It would go through this, and then this part, once it was finished, would go to the next operation. Um, so anyway, I hope you like that. And I hope you this inspires you to go ahead and try to automate this yourself and see what you can do with Prism on one of the existing hero models. So like we always say, have fun, build some robots, come back and see us.